So, Peter, you've just written about the three wars that are having an impact on Australia's security and that there are lessons that we can learn from each of them. So I want to start with China. You've written that this conflict is the one we most need to worry about. Why? Well, of the three wars, the one between Israel and Hamas, the one between Russia and Ukraine, the one between China and the West, I suppose, broadly constructed, uh, the Israel-Hamas war primarily as a risk to us through domestic security, uh, through the risk of terrorism, uh, social uh, conflict. The Russia-Ukraine war is primarily a threat to Australian security because depending on who wins, it will change the balance of global power. And if the Russians should prevail in their, quote, no limits, unquote, partnership with China, that puts um, a lot of extra... Uh, oomph on 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 the uh, team of autocracy and the anti-West anti-liberty brigade. So that is a that is a, a really big important equation, but it's still an indirect one. In the case of our Chinese friends, uh, Xi Jinping's avowed aim is to, and he said this in the at the very beginning of his term, and he said it since, uh, to put China in a position. He said, "I will put China in a in a position to take the initiative." and assert dominance, meaning dominance, not of, he didn't qualify it, dominance of everything. So, uh, and it's the country that, whose behaviours are first have been hostile to Australian interests, uh, second have demanded Australian changes in Australian sovereign policy, uh, most blatantly through the 14 demands that uh, China's embassy in Canberra served. And, um, uh, third, from its conduct, we can see and surmise that it's thinking about how to recreate Japan's uh, strategy in World War II, which was not to invade Australia, but to sever its connections uh, to the world, to sever its uh, sea lines of communication through the Pacific Islands, as as you know, the way the Japanese occupied the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, it was all designed to to deny Australia the opportunity to continue to operate in the war and to de deny the US the ability to use Australia as a base. And it looks suspiciously as though that is the long-term Chinese intention against Australia this time too. That's the reason that China is the primary direct concern for Australian security. You've written specifically that China engages what you've called grey zone warfare, has been doing so for more than a decade uh, with relation to Australia, and that it's surprisingly effective at threatening our sovereignty and liberty. So why is that? It's surprisingly effective because the People's Liberation Army has operated this policy against a bunch of countries, made a bunch of acquisitions, territorial acquisitions, and nobody has figured out how to stop it uh, or, or even really slow it down very much. So in that process, uh, the Chinese military established 20 new military facilities on islands through the South China Sea, islands which were uh, based on small rock outcrops or reefs, islands which were claimed by other countries, islands which the Chinese army then built into larger islands and then erected military bases on them. All of that without having to fire a shot. Now, that is brilliant. And when I asked um, Barack Obama's senior Asia advisor at the White House at, the, at that time uh, why Obama had uh, demanded that China stop and yet do absolutely nothing when it went ahead and occupied these territories and, and militarized them. Um, Danny Russell, the advisor, said, because there was no way we could stop the Chinese without using force against them. And we weren't about to do that. The Americans didn't want to take the risk. The Chinese were daring them to take the risk. The Americans backed off. They didn't want the risk of a war. Uh, who could blame them? But uh, that, this is why it works. Then the Chinese expanded this technique, adapted it, Xi Jinping adapted it to use against Japan, against Taiwan. Mm. Uh, it's being used uh, in multiple places. It's being used not only against territories now, but also militaries. And the Chinese People's Liberation Army, Air Force and Navy have been uh, using this friction technique, recklessly maneuvering against other countries' militaries. Um, as we saw in Australia just a few days ago, with the intention of uh, just intimidating other countries and backing them off. It's a game of chicken where the Chinese are the last ones to look away. Without having to fire, they fire water cannon, they uh, 
they'll crash into other navies or ships from time to time when it suits. They'll, they'll cut tow lines. They'll do all that sort of stuff. They won't fire a gun. Now, they've taken all those gains uh, without firing a single bullet. That is genius. Mm. And nobody has yet managed to defeat or figure out how to defeat this grey zone uh, combat that the Chinese are pioneering and specialising in. And you just mentioned before, of course, there was an incident just last week in which two Australian Navy divers were injured when a Chinese ship aimed powerful sonar at them. So what happened there? So there's, there's two aspects to it. First, it was conducted in a Japanese, territory, a Japanese econ exclusive economic zone where Australia had been invited to operate. Uh, the Australian craft was enforcing sanctions, uh, UN sanctions against North Korea for its nuclear uh, violations. Um, in the process, the Australian craft got its propellers tangled, stopped to untangle them, sent divers into the water, warned nearby shipping. Uh, the Chinese vessel uh, acknowledged the warning and yet approached more closely and then fired the uh, sonar at the ship. Now, that's the incident. The Australians uh, publicised it, complained about it, mm. uh, called it dangerous and unprofessional, which is a, a specific category in international law to, to label it dangerous and unprofessional. But the point of it, was twofold in my view. The point of it was to show Australia that this is the third now public incident that we that where our Navy or armies or Air Forces told us about it in two years. Uh, and what this incident tells us is that we don't care that you are, now have a political level rapprochement. We don't care that your Prime Minister has just renewed top level relations mm. with our president and our president uh, is sending you this special present. Uh, it's like flowers from the mafia. Or in the old Chinese adage, I see daggers in your smile. Even as Xi Jinping is smiling at Anthony Albanese, um, he's sending daggers to uh, intimidate and back off the Australian military. And the, and the intention is, uh, over time, to back off everybody so China's military can assert hegemony, unchecked and unchallenged, in the South China Sea. And now I want to move on to the other two wars that you've written about. So first to the war between Israel and Hamas. We're now six weeks into that conflict, but you've written there's actually some relief there. So what is it and is there anything we can learn from that? Yes, but you'll remember from the very first days of this conflict, uh, experts around the world expressed concern that Iran uh, could, could escalate the pressure on Israel. Of course, Hamas being uh, an extension of Iran, it's a proxy force created, armed, financed uh, by Iran. And the question was whether the Iranians were going to mobilize any of their other proxy forces against Israel. Mm. So uh, the good news in this dreadful, dreadful war with so much death and suffering, the good news is it hasn't escalated uh, to the point where the Iranians have either uh, um, engaged or ordered into battle Hezbollah uh, or their proxy mil militias in Syria or the proxy uh, militias in Iraq uh, or the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Uh, now, all of those forces have sort of um, harassed the Israelis. Not, not one of them has taken serious military action against Israel. Because uh, if the Iranians really wanted to uh, put pressure on Israel, they would simply activate all of those. And those groups would generally be pretty happy to hop in and attack Israel. I mean, as you know, Hezbollah alone is estimated to have 150,000 missiles and the Israelis are deeply worried about them getting involved. But it's now been six weeks. Mm. All the evidence is that the Iranians do not want to escalate and that they're happy with the damage that's so far been done, that's already been done, and that Israel, by overreacting, in my view, to the terrorist attack of Hamas, uh, has actually um, assisted Iran in achieving in achieving uh, unambiguous victories from this Hamas attack. But the, the fact that it's not escalating and doesn't seem to be preparing to escalate is unambiguously good news because instead of measuring the, the deaths in thousands, we'd be measuring them in the hundreds of thousands if that were to happen. And it would be a full-scale war. It would probably involve the US. It might involve Iran directly if Iran decided to really destroy Israel and, quote, push all the Jews into the sea, unquote, which is their stated aim. But they've stopped short of that, and that's a good thing. And on to the war between Russia and Ukraine. You wrote that just last week, 
Ukraine actually had a win. So what's the significance of that win and what lessons, if any, can we take from that? Yes, uh, I suppose the one lesson is that the um, what had long been assumed to be a, a stalemate where the two forces had fought to a standstill uh, in the so-called counter-offensive that the Ukrainians were waging uh, has come to an end with a Ukrainian breakthrough. It's, it's uh, a, a clear cut and a significant breakthrough. Russians in their initial invasion took the city of Kherson um, on the banks of the Dnipro River. The Ukrainians managed uh, to force them out again. It was the only regional capital city that the Russians had managed to take and the Ukrainians have now taken it back. Uh, and the Russians were forced to retreat onto the eastern banks of the Dnipro River. But that's where it stalemated. And what's happened in the last week is that the Ukrainians managed to cross the river, which is a bit of a feat because it's 10 kilometer wide uh, expanse of water, um, and push the Russians back on the east bank of the Dnipro River. Uh, and the reports yesterday from Ukraine were that they pushed them back three to eight kilometers, which is a, a, a significant advance, and the Russians were heavily dug in. So this, this is a breakthrough, and that uh, potentially opens the way now for the Ukrainians to fight the Russians all the way through to Crimea, which is a real prize for, that the Russians are now holding and have been holding since 2014. Uh, so that shows, I think, that the uh, the long-assumed stalemate is no longer a stalemate. There's action, that the Ukrainians are still uh, capable of fighting and winning, that the counter-offensive is underway still. So it's a sign of hope for the Ukrainians. But the the, the other, the even larger uh, point I'd, I'd make, Samantha, is that the, the compared to the other wars we've just talked about, this is state-on-state state war. The other two are asymmetrical wars. So what Hamas did is asymmetrical. Terrorism, what the Chinese are doing is asymmetrical. Grey zone, uh, pressure tactics. But it's what the Russians have done against the Ukrainians. And uh, a year and a half on, it's just not working very well. It's a dumb form of warfare. It's from a playbook of yesteryear. It's something where Putin... Um, has fallen into into the trap of thinking it would be an easy and mm -hmm. uh, a quick walkover. And obviously it's just become immensely costly to Russia, to its army, to its people, to its economy, and of course to Vladimir Putin's own political standing. We've seen at least, we've, we know of at least one attempted coup against him from Prigozhin. So uh, it's, it, you know, a simple quick victory that he thought he could conduct in a week uh, is no such thing. There are always multiple conflicts erupting at any time around the world. They're often not reported on, but they're there. But is it rare to have three separate wars impacting Australia's security at the same time? Yes. Uh, there are something, depending on the definition, and there are different measures around the world and different groups keep count of how many wars are going on. There's somewhere between 30 and 40 wars going on around the world at the moment, mm. uh, mainly civil wars. But Yes, it's, it's really unusual, and it's, it's unusual enough, enough that there's one war going on that directly affects Australia's security. Uh, we've now got one directly and two indirectly uh, affecting Australia's security as we see a, fractu a fracturing of um, Pax Americana, and we see more and more states challenging uh, the, the existing boundaries with the Chinese, the Russians. But to have so many uh, capitals testing existing borders to be revisionist and expansionist and to be threatening Australia uh, in the process, directly and indirectly. Uh, this is this is a combination we haven't seen since the end of the Cold War, 1991. Peter, always great to get your insights. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, Samantha.